Hello, everybody. Thank you, Russ. Um, thank you all for coming on our, our Zoom today. I'm very pleased to welcome um, a, a good friend, Mickey Edwards. Uh, Mickey, I, I've known him for a decade and admire him a great deal. For those of you who don't know Mickey, uh, he represented Oklahoma's 5th Congressional District from 1977 to 1993. He was the, the fourth ranking Republican House leader during much of the, the Reagan Bush era. And since leaving Congress, uh, he's had a prolific career in academia and public policy, teaching at Harvard, Georgetown, Princeton, and leading projects at Brookings, the Constitution Project, and most recently, the Aspen Institute, where he founded and led the acclaimed Aspen Institute Rodell Fellowships for Public Leadership. And about, actually, it's exactly 10 years ago, Mickey dropped something of a bombshell. Uh, he wrote an article entitled How to Turn Republicans and Democrats into Americans that cataloged the various ways that the, the Democrats and Republicans, uh, private organizations, had taken control of the electoral and the legislative process and structures. And this piece, I, I, I don't overstate it, it was a game changer. For the first time, you had a, a mainstream insider, a mainstream political player, pulling back the curtain on exactly how the political parties were driving dysfunction and partisanship. And it had a very big impact on the conversation within the political reform movement. We're going to get into that in a few minutes. Mickey gave actually a, an excellent TED talk um, several years ago that, that expanded on the themes of his article. And I, I before I bring Mickey on, I want to take a, a quick look at that TED Talk. So Russell, Russ, can you play that? In our founders warned it against it. We have a system that is designed not to represent the American people, but to represent the interests of the parties. You know, so you have speakers of the House, Democrat or Republican, men or women, who are party leaders. They're not legislative leaders. They work on a partisan agenda. So this sounds to me, and probably sounds to you, like a hell of a downer. I, it isn't. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I'm optimistic. In my view, the revolution has already begun. USA Today had an article that said that the American people are fleeing from the political party system. More people are registering as independents than Republicans or Democrats. So here's what happened. In 2006, the people of Washington state looked at what was happening in American government and they basically said, we had enough of it. And they went to the polls and they changed their system. They did away with closed party primaries and said all the candidates run. Everybody who wants to run and is qualified to run. Everybody runs and the voters can choose whoever they want. And they did away with party control of redistricting. That was, that's Washington state in 2006. In 2010, California did it. And California got rid of closed party primaries and California got rid of party control of redistricting. And there was an article in the New York Times front page last week that in California, they are finally passing legislation in a bipartisan way. Look, our system is supposed to be a constitutional democracy where as long as what is done with within the confines of the constitution, the will of the people will prevail. Wow, I wish we could show that whole TED talk. Welcome, Mickey. Uh, thank you so much for taking some time to talk today. Um, I have just a few questions to get the conversation going. And then as Russell mentioned, I wanna open it up to our audience today. Um, all right, so we, the, the title of our, our Zoom today is, are the political parties too weak, too strong or obsolete? And you know, I think the parties are obsolete, personally. I think they're hindering progress 
uh, on many different levels. I know you think the parties have overstepped their bounds and need to be repositioned as private associations. Um, there's independents like Peter Ackerman, like Jackie Salit, like Greg Orman, many others have been saying this for years. Uh, and let's not forget Ross Perot back in the 90s. And most recently you have Catherine Gale and Michael Porter who wrote just a, an absolutely brilliant analysis of the, the duopoly, the two party control of the political industry. And right now today, there are literally dozens of organizations and campaigns working across the country to, to challenge the party control of politics. But let me just, let me just play devil's advocate here. I think it's safe to say the dominant position, certainly in Washington, but also many people in political science and, and including in the political reform world is actually that the parties and the party system needs to be strengthened. Um, and um, look at HR1, the Democrats voting rights bill. It explicitly strengthens the party's position in the electoral process. Peggy Noonan just two days ago wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal um, about the importance of saving the Republican party. Uh, the Washington Post ran a piece last Wednesday uh, entitled Five Myths About Political Parties to really challenge the notion that the parties are the problem. I just wanna read a little quote from this article, this Washington Post piece. At every stage of the democratic process, political parties play a crucial role in getting things done. Without the structure parties provide, log rolling, favor trading and compromise on legislation would have to start from scratch each time a bill is proposed. Party leaders can bargain with one another on behalf of their members and shepherd agreements that individual members could not achieve. So I, I feel like the timing of this Zoom call is perfect. This, is a, this question about the parties is a hot topic. There's, there is literally a tug of war going on in the country. So what, what's driving this controversy, this conversation, this fight? What, what do you think is going on in the country right now that is driving such a, a robust conversation about the role of the parties? Up, oh, you're on mute. Yeah, I know. I, I do that all the time. I did it too. Uh, what can I say? I, well, I, I did that because I'm sort of rebelling against you showing that, <laughs> that because the main problem with that TED talk is I weighed about 30 pounds more <laughs> than I do now. Okay. So, see ya. Um, well, there's actually, let, let, let me address it in a, in a bigger, broader picture. But one of the reasons that, that people are looking for some answer, some are saying, you know, parties need to be stronger, more controlled, whatever, uh, is because it doesn't work. It, it, it's not working. Uh, and I think there's not much disagreement in the country that there's something seriously wrong. Uh, a lot of people say that it's dysfunctional. And as you know, I've written several times, it's not dysfunctional because it's functioning exactly the way it's designed to function. Uh, that's the system we have, and that's why we get the results we want. But let, let me just make a few uh, bigger points uh, on that. The first of all, in terms of the party and how whether it should be stronger or not strong, it depends on the purpose. It depends on the purposes of government. Uh, why you want your government it depends on uh, whether you want the people to have the final voice or or to have that their voice stifled by having parties limit the choices that they have when they go to the ballot box. So, first of all, uh, should should we strengthen the parties? Which, when they say that, means the party leaders. When they say strengthen the parties, they mean that the people who run the party ought to be able to tell the members what to do. So. Imagine when I had run for office in Oklahoma City uh, in uh, my, first, my first election, uh, I went around, I talked to people in uh, town meetings and speeches and in interviews, and I said, here's who I am. I introduced myself. They got to know who I am as a person. They got to know what I believe and decide whether I was articulate, decide whether I was intelligent, and they vote for me. They come here and say, okay, we're going to send you to Washington. And I say to them, great, I've listened to you. You've put your trust in me. And I'm going to go to Washington and I'm going to do whatever Kevin McCarthy or Nancy Pelosi tells me to do. Right. And I mean, 
that because that's the way it would work. If you have you want top down, that's fine. If you don't believe in a system that is designed for the people to speak. Now, one of the things people forget, and and the political scientists seem to have not realized that. I I I shouldn't say that. I teach. You know, I know friends of mine who are political scientists. I'm not sure they've read the Constitution as thoroughly as they have, as they should. The Founding Fathers, the Constitution, very deliberately rejects the parliamentary system, which is party-based, top-down system, will we'll decide who will represent Surrey in, in, uh, in Parliament. Uh, and they reject it in two ways. Number one, you must be an actual inhabitant of the state from which you are elected. The whole idea is it's representative government, Right. Citizen and constituents, not the party. Uh, and the second is that it is designed to have separation of powers so that in our constitution, nobody can serve in the executive branch and legislative branch at the same time, uh, which of course is the hallmark of a parliamentary system, is that you do, and they're combined. So that's one one thing. Um, are, are, is the party system obsolete? I believe that there was a time, long time ago, when you actually needed parties. You needed them because people had no way to get information. They couldn't find out enough about the candidates. They could not find out enough about the issues. They had no ability to marshal large numbers of people to take a, an action together. They couldn't do that. So, so the world has changed. We don't need that anymore. You know, most of the changes of any great movement that happened today come from outside that. They, they come from right. Black Lives Matter or uh, any other kind of mothers against drunk driving. People organize without the parties. Uh, so the parties are obsolete in that regard. Um, the other uh, point I want to make is that um, what you need to have to make the system work is the ability to have all of us come together once we're elected, talk to each other, deliberate without having pressure. You go along with this agenda. We preset agenda. We, here's our agenda. Here's their agenda. And our purpose is not to, not to govern. Our purpose is to defeat the other side so that we can have power, so that we can impose our agenda on the country, which undermines the whole deliberative process. So. And the final thing I'll say, maybe this is going to be a question you were going to ask. Uh, can it be done without parties? Yeah, I want well, to ask you about that. The, the Declaration of Independence, probably the, the uh, most dramatic thing that's ever happened uh, in this country, uh, because everybody who signed that declaration was actually committing treason and putting their lives on the line, was done without dividing into political parties. The Constitution was written without dividing into political parties. You know, so, and I, I said, there's a lot of people on this call, I can see that. Every one of you either belongs to a church or a synagogue or a corporate board or a civic organization, and you all get together all of the time to make decisions about what you're gonna do, what you're gonna build, what you're gonna spend. You never divide into two rival political groups in order to do that. That's not the way we do anything in our lives, except the way we try to run our government. And that's why it doesn't work. So what do you say, Mickey, when people say, hey, but remember what well, you were in Congress during this time, you had Tip O'Neill, you had Ronald Reagan, these kind of strong party leaders, and they were able to create a kind of stable deal-making bipartisan environment in which the will of the American people got done. What do you, what do you say to that argument that the factionalization right now is because the parties have become too decentralized and weak and they need to be strengthened. Um, I, I, would, I would say that's a matter of short-term memory. So uh, okay. I, I was there at the time, John. Uh, I don't wanna get racy here with, with the name of one of the, one of the uh, famous movies, but it was more a, a question of dominance and submission. <laughs> the, uh, uh, right now, the country is not the country that existed then. Bill Bishop, my friend, and maybe yours, who wrote The Big Sort, began pointing that out. Um, we're, we're evenly divided for, for years now. The Congress has been pretty evenly divided. 
uh, even in our uh, presidential elections, we're pretty evenly divided. During those days that are supposedly the magic days, uh, it's that the one party, in that case, it was the Democrats, had such huge majorities. I think that, uh, I think the year I was elected, uh, Democrats had like a hundred more members than, than Republicans had. Uh, and that was the way all the time, they had huge majorities. So there was no problem for them, uh, in that case, it was the Democrats, to go along with something we wanted to put in it, because then they had the veneer of bipartisanship. Uh, and Republicans would say, well, look, if I can just get this one little thing in there, I'll support it if I can just get this one little thing, because there was one party dominance. It was nothing like what we have today. And we're not going to go back. It's not going to change because the country is different today. You know, I was telling someone I was going to be hosting this call with you and they said, oh, I know Mickey Edwards. He's the guy who wants to get rid of the political parties. Right. Is that, I'm sure people say that to you all the time. Is that you know, accurate? How do you respond to that? Well, one, one of the things about uh, making an argument like this is you have to get it published. So uh, most of my stuff has been recently published by Oxford University Press, Yale University Press. Uh, and, you know, they, they, they want to make it dramatic. Um, where do, we can't get rid of political parties totally because everyone on this call belongs to groups of people and they assemble. We, you know, we have freedom of, uh, of getting around with getting, getting along with other people and meeting with them and, and working collectively. Now, what I'm really talking about is, if I can kind of paraphrase Bill Clinton and, and welfare, getting rid of parties as we know them. Uh, so that the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, or 25 other parties that you want to create will exist as groups of private citizens who can say, we wish you would contribute to John Updike. Uh, we hope you'll vote for him. But they will have no control over the process. They can't control if you're running for Congress. They can't control the districts. They can't have a primary that weeds out. You know, so I said, see, uh, on my screen, as you're sitting there next to Jeremy, um, and so let's say you and Jeremy are running against each other. He's, I got, he, to tell you, John, he's much more popular than you are. And that's but, uh, patently but, obvious. But if he wins the primary, but if you win the primary, if you win the primary because you've got all the party activists supporting you, he can't run. He can't run. Got it. So it's parties have like they any group away from the parties. Right. They have the right to exist and organize. They just don't get to control the process. Right. Right. And, and, and you would have a system uh, as we did in the first Congress uh, where you all of us get together, all of us here on the screen get together. We're all elected to Congress. Uh, and several of you say, I would like to be speaker and I would like to be speaker. And so, so we all vote and you campaign among us, we pick a speaker uh, and the party doesn't get to control what bills get assigned to committee, what bills get a vote. You know, the group does that collectively. Again, like we do in every other thing we, we do. You know, I've gotten to know Adam Morfeld, who's a, a state senator in Nebraska over the last couple of years. Nebraska has the only state legislature that's not controlled by the parties. And right. it is night and day when you don't have party control of the legislative process right. in terms of the coalitions that come together, you know, people from different parties sponsoring legislation together, the debate. It's just like, it's a totally different thing. And yet Nebraska is related to like an outlier, like other states or even Congress couldn't do it. Um, now, Mickey, I'm going to ask you to weigh in on something very controversial. <laughs> no, I've never. Uh, yes. Um, I actually, I want to talk to you about independent voters. Yeah. So you mentioned this in your TED Talk, um, which you gave, I think, five or six years ago. The numbers are actually higher than when you gave that talk. The Gallup poll a few weeks after the impeachment trial had independence at 50%. It's now gone down a few points. But there's this very, I find extremely curious discussion about independence. So you have these statistics, you have the, the, the growth in voter registration, but you have the political science world, the Washington world, the punditry, the people that are on Meet the Press. They say um, independents are not really independents. It's just something cool people like to say about themselves. Um, and in fact, independence, if you scratch the surface, what they really are is partisan leaners. They're, they're kind of like Democrats and Republicans light. 
So the, here's what's curious. You have the American people saying, I'm an independent. I don't want to join a political party. In fact, I don't, I don't really like political parties. As you say, they might have had a function in an era in which it was hard to get information. That's not 21st century America. But then you have all the political experts saying, this rise of independence is just a myth. It's, it's, it's not important. And by the way, we need stronger parties. So do, what do you think of statement people are making when they say, when they register to vote as an independent? Is it insignificant or is it a meaningful kind of statement of protest? Uh, you know, um, you and I, I'm an independent now, by the way, I left the Republican Party. Uh, I, sure, I, I lean in one direction or another, you do. Uh, you favor a little more government or a little less. But when candidates come, you, you measure them against each other. You measure their, their uh, views, what they're advocating, uh, their quali qualifications. Um, and that is an independent action. It doesn't mean that in order to be an independent, you shut off all views about everything. You know, that uh, uh, I am probably more inclined to favor people in one direction or another, could be a Democrat, could be a Republican. Uh, but uh, that doesn't in any way negate the idea that, that the problem is the way the parties control things. Uh, and, and there are a growing number of people who say, we're rebelling against the system, we're rebelling against having to go to the polls and, and choose, I hope I don't offend anybody, choose between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, who were probably the uh, two most unpopular uh, candidates we'd had in a long time, whether they should have been or not. Um, it doesn't mean that, that you're neutered as to whether you believe things, but it means that you are open to listening to both sides and deciding which one you like best either because of a policy or because of the nature of the candidate they have put forth. Uh, I, you know, independent simply means I'm not locked into your menu. I'm not locked into, it doesn't matter who you put up or what they believe, I'm for them because that's my club. Uh, and, and in fact, there are a lot of people today who are voters who because they stick with their club. And I think that's doing great harm to American democracy. What have you seen change in the last decade, Mickey, since you wrote this article? Like what, what's the, you know, go up to 30,000 feet for a minute. Um, how, how has the kind of overall political conversation changed in that, on these issues of kind of partisanship and party control in the last decade? Yeah, well, I don't want to use my article and then my book as a, as a starting point because that looks like I did it and I didn't do it. You know, uh, you, you and other people, you know, who are here may have done far more than I have. But one of the things that's happened in that time is there has been a whole rash of reform movements uh, that have come to the fore, people understanding now uh, that you don't have to live with this system. Um, many, many years ago, a political science professor named E.E. E. Schottschneider uh, wrote a uh, a piece that was very persuasive to political scientists that you cannot have uh, a democracy without political parties, which of course would have been uh, news to the people in the Roman Republic who survived without them for 500 years and, uh, uh, and the Athenian democracy, which had no political parties and Nebraska. Uh, but uh, there is this view finally that it is the system that isn't working. Some people say it's the money. Some people say it's the uh, uh, the redistricting. Some people, whatever. There, there's 20 or some of it, the inability to get an independent on the ballot. There are a lot of different ways, but I think the, the energy right now and the energy for several years has been on the side of those people who are saying, this system needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's different. 10 years ago, when I wrote that article, my article didn't cause it, but, but 10 years ago, none of this was happening or very right. little was happening. Now, now, if you had just a gathering of people who are active in some of these art reform organizations, you, you, you fill up a room if we, if we can actually get together. Right. right. Yeah, I think so. Uh, one more question, then I want to open it up. 
I think that if you look at the redistricting reform movement, if you look at the nonpartisan primary movement, the, the growth has been you know, exponential. I mean, it's, it's probably, there's efforts underway in half the states in the country right now. But are there other aspects of challenging party control that are less sexy, that are less known, that are not getting the kind of work done on them that you wish they were? Um, other elements of this? I, I think one of the um, things that doesn't get talked about, it, it's, it's hard to put in any, in a concrete form, uh, but there are a lot of groups that are coming together now around the idea of liberal democracy. So rather than the uh, reforms being primarily about uh, issue one, which is, you know, money in politics is the big issue or uh, other groups that have identified a single cause. Uh, there's more and more coming together, even across uh, not party line, but, but liberal and conservative together. Um, the idea of liberal democracy is what we have to focus on, regardless of who's in, in control, uh, is freedom of the press, um, uh, the, the ability to have access to the ballot box to vote, uh, and protecting the rule of law. A lot of these things that have come under attack from both the right and the left. Hmm. One, one of the things that bothers me is that political partisans on the right and the left tend not to care about process anymore. They tend not to care a lot about the constitutional guardrails. It's like, what outcome do I want? And what do I have to do to get there? If we have to pack the court to get there, we'll pack the court. If we have to shut off debate, we'll shut off debate. Uh, if we have to pass everything by one vote, we'll pass everything by one vote. And so uh, I, I think the big change that's happened, John, is the number of people who have now begun to say, look, this is not just about parties or, or money in politics, or whatever. This is about protecting the constitutional democracy idea. Uh, and I think that's where the energy is right now. Got it. Well, this is great, Mickey. Um, I want to open it up for questions. Just to remind everyone, if you have a question, uh, put your name and your state in the chat, and then just a one sentence summary of what you want to ask. And then I'll yeah, call I'll on you to ask I'll your question. I'll try to question. get shorter answers too. So. No, you're, you're doing fine. All right, we have a first question. This is from Julie Knudsen in Oklahoma, where you served. She has a question about uh, ending party controlled primaries. Go ahead, Julie, ask your question. Thank you so much, John and Mickey. Thank you so much for participating in this excellent uh, discussion. There seems to be momentum on ending party controlled primary elections coming out of 2020 and the win in Alaska. We now have top four with ranked choice in Alaska top two in California and Washington, jungle primaries in Louisiana, and then nonpartisan elections in Nebraska and in many cities, including Oklahoma City. Do you have a policy preference when it comes to primaries? We in Oklahoma, through my organization, are really exploring different options, primarily top two, and your thoughts would be very much appreciated. So where are you in Oklahoma, Julie? Um, we're, I run a statewide organization. We office in Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, okay, well, I went to OU, but we're sooner. Okay, uh, yay, we were sooner. Uh, so yeah, uh, there's various ways that work, and I, and I like the California system. Uh, I have actually been fairly outspoken about uh, RCV with instant runoff. I, I don't have any problem with RCV. I, I think I think ranked choice voting could be uh, very helpful in some ways. Uh, it does reduce the incivility, but I don't think reducing incivility is the number one purpose of, of having elections. Uh, so if you, if you had RCV with a top two runoff, I, I, I could live with that. Uh, top four, top five, they've been proposed. That doesn't change anything. It's still 
a group thing. It's still RCV. Uh, but if you had a real runoff at the end of the process, uh, I think that would be fine. I think at, because at some point, at some point, I think you have to reach a point that the person you elect to be governor of your state or to go to Washington and vote on whether you go to war, vote on what your taxes are gonna be, ought to be somebody who the majority of the voters selected. Uh, and the only way you do that is with a top two runoff. One of the, I'm, I'm in Massachusetts now because uh, I came up here to teach at Harvard and, I'm st and still have my home here. Uh, here, you know, you get Ed Markey, who's the senator from here, uh, is a friend of mine. Uh, but Ed got elected in a heavily Democratic district in a primary where he got 28% of the vote, 72% of the voters in his own party wanted somebody else, but he got elected. That's how he got to Congress in the first place. I, I think that's wrong. I think that uh, it, has, it should be a majority of the voters who vote. Uh, decide who's going to represent them in any of these offices. And that requires an actual top two runoff. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks for what you're doing in, in my home state. All right. We have a question uh, from Jennifer Bullock in Pennsylvania about Lee Drutman's new book, uh, Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop. Go ahead, Jen, ask your question. Sure. I, I think we were touching on this early on, on this fascinating and important discussion. I was wondering um, what you thought about the argument of destroying the two party stranglehold by having multiple party systems, given that parties um, are, are still a way to organize and represent the needs and wants of the people. And I understand that we can go back to the argument of uh, the constitutional argument or um, how proud we are as independents to be independent. And I'm one of them, but I'm really trying to be open to arguments that poke holes in my passionate commitment <laughs> for nonpartisanship and wanted to see what you thought about um, uh, a re the reform movement to create a the possibility for multiple strong parties. Uh, hi, Jennifer. Um, well, um, I, I, I used to respond just with trying to be funny, saying the two parties we have are so bad, why would you want more? Uh, but no, I, you know, I am not in favor of a multi-party system. There are a couple of, there's more than one reason for that. Uh, they tend to be dysfunctional for the most part. Um, they, but there are worse problems than that. When you have a multi-party system, what you do at the end, you need to create a coalition government. And th those people who advocate third and fourth parties are assuming these are gonna be parties that are centrist, sane, rational, uh, I don't know what the basis is for assuming that. Uh, the, um, and, and so I look at history. I mean, you could have a multi-party system that works. You could have. I, and in many places, it does work. But it doesn't always. Uh, Hitler came to power in Germany because they had a multi-party system uh, where his party uh, never got a majority of the vote, but he became you know, able to form a coalition government. And, and so... Uh, he was put in power. Italy has had a whole series. Italy, he became a, 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 almost a joke politically because of the number of governments that came and went. Italy has, I mean, Israel's had a problem, and I'm very pro-Israel, and Israel's had a problem because uh, the hard right religious groups, you know, are necessary for, for building the coalition and holding on to power. So the idea that somehow if you have more parties, that's going to be the rise of the sane centrist. I don't know where that comes from. So um, uh, I, I just think that the idea of a, because every one of them is going to have their own agenda, they're going to have their own menu, they're going to have uh, the insistence that you adhere to their line. Uh, and, you know, it's, they just add to all those problems, you add the, the necessity of building a coalition, which includes the outliers. That's how you how you build your coalition. Uh, I, 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 you know, maybe somebody can change my mind. But right now, I find 
a multi-party system to be very questionable at best. Thank you. All right, uh, I wanna to go to Jack Santucci. Jack, I'm so glad you're, you're asking this question. Jack's a, uh, at Drexel University and he and I have been kind of talking about these issues on Twitter for a number of months now. So uh, he has a question about, about party cues. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, yeah, I mean, the conventional wisdom, uh, I don't even know if my picture is up, but it doesn't matter. The conventional wisdom in political science is that if you don't give the voter uh, a sort of clear choice between or among parties, Voters don't really know what they're choosing among, and um, a number of them are going to abstain altogether. Uh, another possibility is that participation is limited to the most informed voters, which tends to be the most well-off voters, and you get a sort of upper-class policy bias. Uh, so in my world, a lot of people look at basically this flirtation with nonpartisan elections, and they, and they worry about going in that direction. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on any of that. Well, I, first of all, I think the, the idea of the cues is, is a little bit um, uncertain. So if I decide I'm going to vote always for a Democrat because I kind of know what they believe, uh, am I going to get Chuck Schumer or Joe Manchin? Uh, you know, they, they, um, uh, it's, it's an insufficient um, way to measure it. Uh, but the, the cues give you a sense maybe on an issue. But what would, what would come out of what I'm proposing is shifting coalitions. So um, Jack, you and I uh, might agree on uh, tariffs. If, if we agree, then it'd be you know, for lower tariffs on, 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 uh, uh, on my side. But, uh, but we might disagree a lot on um, whether or not we would uh, set the tax rate at this or the minimum wage at this or uh, more border security or whatever. Uh, so it's not that coalitions would disappear. You'd have shifting coalitions. Now, I don't know very many people who go to the polls and they happen to all be in sync and online on, on a whole wide range of issues. Why? Because there are so many things government deals with. You know, mask mandates or no mask mandates. So trying to bring everybody into these two menus instead of where you pick and choose and you find the candidate who best suits the majority of your views uh, makes more sense. So I, I think the cues are, you know, it gives you a cue about something, but it doesn't give you a cue about everything. And, and I'll use Joe Manchin or my good friend Kristen Cinema in Arizona and others who just aren't that predictable because they have a variety of views that aren't all you know, consistent with their party. You know, just to add to that, um, there was an interesting, two quick thoughts. One is that in California, when they enacted the nonpartisan primaries, you started getting general elections where you'd have two Democrats or two Republicans facing off against each other. So in some ways, voters said, well, we can't, we can't rely on just, you know, red, blue anymore. And what they found is that Google searches went up by like 200% where voters actually had to go look at the candidates. And I think that's a positive dynamic because uh, frankly, uh, we, the American people have to get more engaged and connected and, and uh, work harder um, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna make progress on kind of reconstructing our political process. But the other thing, Jack, and I've been involved in campaigns in which that charge, that if you go to nonpartisan elections, working class people, poor people, people of color are gonna be hurt because you're taking away that party cue. I think that it is coming from a democratic party which runs most cities in the country that doesn't wanna to have to work that hard to get those votes. They wanna make, they wanna keep, you know, communities of color in particular captured in the Democratic Party. And they use that as a scare tactic that basically voters are not capable of really getting into nuanced political discussions. And I think that's a disservice um, to people, working class people, poor people, people of color. You know, I think it actually is, um, is a disservice there. Um, all right, I wanna to go to Harry Kresge who has a question about the, the infrastructure bill in Congress right now. Harry from New York, go ahead, Harry. Hi, John. Hey. Uh, hi, Mickey. Great to hear from you again. Hey. Uh, 
for years I've been in agreement with your take on political parties. Uh, and then I find myself watching the news and reading the newspaper and saying, I'm so glad that Joe Biden is seeking bipartisan support for his infrastructure bill. Am I being duped? Is that silly? Does it really matter? Um, it's funny. I just, uh, Harry, I ju just had an interview yesterday uh, with uh, a writer from uh, Pittsburgh uh, who was asking my ideas about whether or not Biden was doing a good job on uh, bipartisanship. I, I think Joe Biden really seriously wants to be known as the guy who brings people together. I think he does want bipartisanship more than anything. He's an institutionalist, uh, but he is he has a couple of problems. One is the nature of political parties. So it is not um, uh, the Republican Party doesn't have a whole lot of incentive uh, to make him look good and and to uh, uh, get things done. The left wants him to include a lot of things that, that make it really hard for uh, Republicans to come on board and even conservative Democrats. Uh, so you look at, at the infrastructure bill, which is uh, got stuff that's really badly desperately needed for infrastructure repair and a lot of other things that don't have much to do with infrastructure. Uh, and, uh, and you have him now creating a commission on, and I supported Biden very actively. Kamala is a very close friend of mine. But, uh, you know, a commission on looking about the possibility of increasing the size of the Supreme Court. Uh, so Biden's under a lot of pressure from all sides. And it's going to be very hard for him to continue to try to find the compromise. I will say on the infrastructure bill, um, he is signaling, he is sending big signals that the administration is open to compromise. And, and that was good. I was really glad, glad to see that. And I think he'll meet some people, you know, coming his way, maybe to me, you know, some others. Thank you. All right, we're going to a tough question from uh, Daniel in Alabama uh, about the difference between data-driven and opinion-driven solutions. Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, so just for reference, I've been working with a group, uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, and they have really good data that backs up, you know, okay, we have a specific policy solution, and we have data that supports that solution. I'm wondering, is there such a thing right now? I see a lot of reform groups, but I don't see anybody saying, here's a very specific solution with data that, that supports it. What, what, kind of, uh, what kind of issue are you talking about? Are you talking about a, a political system or a... So, well, CCL's thing is, is climate change, but, but in terms of political reform, do we have, are there groups out there that are making a similar, you know, very direct, okay, we have legislative language that we can get people behind and data that shows that this would move the needle in some positive way? You know, I, I think there are a lot of different kinds of groups who are doing uh, stuff like that. Uh, one of the problems we have uh, is that the hold of party is so strong that a lot of people start out with a bi confirmation bias that if it came from X, you know, who is on my team, that that's what I'm going and you dismiss information, data, good, well-researched stuff that, that would argue the other side. Um, so, um, I'm not going to mention his name, a former college president who's a good friend of mine, once said about um, uh, some solutions that we were trying to propose to a particular issue. He said, you know, we don't have a supply problem. We have a demand problem. Uh, so I think there is a plentiful supply of adequate data to make decisions on climate or a lot of other things. But that doesn't mean we've got people who are willing to listen to it uh, and make decisions based on what the data says. And I think that's, that's the more fundamental problem. I do think there's a lot of, a lot of groups putting together data on reform ideas, uh, as in California, measuring that, and policy ideas. All right, we have, Mickey, we have a bunch of questions. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm only going to call in one of them, from Donna Sauerberger, Jared Applewhite, Steve Barrett, New Jersey, um, Maryland, about some of these questions about 
the relationship between open primaries and ranked choice voting and how they can be combined and whether they should be combined and the best way to combine them. So I'm actually going to call on um, Steve Barrett uh, from New Jersey to kind of give expression to these set of questions. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. And thank you, Mickey. Very informative. Um, so my, I don't know that I'm speaking for a group because I'm not sure the genesis of the other folks' questions. But, but first, you mentioned that that a, that a two-candidate runoff is 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 in, is critical, um, and I'm wondering how ranked choice voting comes up short in your mind, um, and then and then the whole concept of of two parties. I'm from New Jersey, so. I'm disenfranchised as an unaffiliated voter. Um, how effective is something like ranked choice voting in a situation where the parties have essentially complete control over who gets to run in the general election? And so how is open primaries effective without ranked choice voting and vice versa? Because um, you know what, everybody talks about what boss Tweed said, which was, I don't care who runs in the general election as long as I get to do the nominating. So, so expand a little bit on, on what you said relative to ranked choice voting and versus a, a, a runoff um, and, 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 and how ranked choice voting is effective in, a, in essentially a two party system. Well, if you had the open primaries, you know, then, then it's essentially from, for the purposes of putting people on the general election ballot. Uh, there are no party primaries, you know, it's just uh, whoever the, uh, the final two who got the most votes. Uh, ranked choice voting would be a way of determining who those top two would be. So I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be open to RCV. Uh, I think you have to start with what are the purposes of government, however. Uh, if the purpose of government is to elect the people who are the least controversial, or the, the least unpopular, then that's what RCV does. It gives you the, uh, the person who is the least unpopular. Uh, I don't know that that's really what the purpose ought to be of an election, uh, but I don't have a problem with it if at the top, the, so to the more direct answer, my problem is not with RCV because you have to have some system that I guess weeds out the 40 candidates. My problem is that the people who propose it also propose instant runoff uh, and or, so instant runoff means that you never have a chance to have the voters look at these people, let's say the top two or four or five, I think it should be two. Um, you never see them side by side without all the other people in, in the mix with all the game playing about who you're going to trash and who you're not going to trash. Uh, it's going to be uh, something where you're not going to be able to hear them debate each other, not compare uh, your, your policies against John's, not be able to compare your uh, intelligence against John's or your articulation against John's, you know, it, it's going to be instant runoff destroys all that. Uh, and you, I, I, I think that the issues that Congress deals with are so strong, so important to every single person or state legislatures deal with or governors deal with that at the end of the process, you need to see what your choices are side by side, measure them against each other uh, in a meaningful way uh, and decide then which of these two uh, are the best ones for you. Um, I, 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 RCV just basically makes it, a, uh, it's not a popularity contest, it's about who's the least controversial. So FDR would not have won, Reagan would not have won. Mm -hmm. but, you know, they get weeded out in favor of the people who won't rock the boat. Uh, maybe that's fine, maybe that's what you want, but maybe sometimes what the country needs is somebody who has, you know, really big ideas and they can persuade you that this needs to be done. So um, I, 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 I'm sort of lukewarm on RCV and very against it with when it's compared with instant runoff. Okay, thanks. Mickey, I wanna, I wanna ask you a question about, about um, 
kind of the conservative movement because you come from the, the right side of the political spectrum. And um, I was having a conversation uh, last week with a member of the open primary spokesperson committee named Joe Kirby. He lives in South Dakota, um, extremely conservative businessman um, and has emerged as one of the most vocal proponents for a wide range of reforms in South Dakota. And here's the argument that he makes, which I find very compelling. Tell me what you think about this. He says, look, I'm a proud Republican, but one of the things we know as conservatives is that when you don't have competition, when you don't have robust accountability and competition, when you have a monopoly, and the Republican Party has a virtual monopoly in South Dakota, you end up with subpar policy, lack of innovation. He draws a direct relationship between competition and good results. So do you think the parties are sitting on competition? Do you think if we kind of push the parties back into this role as private organizations, you would see a flourishing of political competition? Sure, because you would have people who uh, weren't worried about how they please the, you know, the most extreme left or right base uh, of a party. Uh, and you, I think you'd have more candidates. Uh, I think you'd have a bigger variety of viewpoints. Uh, you wouldn't have everybody who's there trying to say, uh, how can I uh, satisfy AOC or satisfy uh, the Donald? Uh, I, I think you, you could, uh, it would flourish un under that. I, but I do want to say, uh, since you mentioned the kind of the conservative, I, it's hard to know what the definition of conservative is. But let, let me say, uh, a lot of the people who are conservatives, and I, that's the label I always carry, uh, are always talking about small government. There is nothing about conservatism that requires small government. It requires government that is prudent, that is, uh, that operates within the constitutional guardrails. But, you know, my hero, James Madison, you know, was for limited government. But, you know, it doesn't mean it's small. It's, it stays within the guardrails of what government's able to do and not able to do uh, and obeys those limits. But within those limits, you, you know, you could have government active in a whole great number of areas. So I, I think we get caught up in all this rhetoric. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, we used to have these debates, John, where people would say, you, you get a Republican and a Democrat or a liberal and a conservative. And uh, the liberal would say, we're a democracy. And the Republican, the conservative would say, no, we're not, we're a republic. And they would fight to the death over whether we were a republic or a democracy. It's the silliest argument anybody ever had, because we're both. We are a repub constitutional republic in our form of government. Uh, and a democracy in the way we choose the people who are going to make the decisions uh, in that constitutional republic. Uh, but we get into these nothing debates and arguments right. uh, that make no sense whatsoever. So I guess I am, you call me, I'm, I'm probably a conservative, liberal, communitarian, whatever. Uh, and I like it. They, so it's kind I, of. I ask about the competition because, you know, Unite America just came out with a, a, a really great report on the, called the the problem, the, the primary problem in which they, they put out a statistic that 85% of the members of Congress are shoo-ins. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, what kind of, when, when you don't have competitive general elections, what kind of environment does that breed? Um, so I don't I, want to monopolize. John, I see Julia still on the screen here and uh, she, she would know in Oklahoma, uh, basically now we, we had for one term, in Oklahoma City, you know, in one term, there was a Democrat, but otherwise, you know, it's a, it, it's completely Republican area. Other states are completely Democrat. Uh, but if you remove the party ability to limit the choices that you get at the ballot box in the general election, uh, I think you would have many more candidates in the race and a lot more variety. Got it. All right. Couple more questions. This is uh, uh, Lester Levine has a question about the problem solvers caucus in Congress. Go ahead, Lester. Uh, 
this group has been around, I think, for about 10 years, half Republican, half Democrat. They didn't get any press until last fall when at least some of the mass media gives them credit for being the only thing that got $600 check, dollar checks out to people hurt by the virus. Recently, they're getting some more press uh, about working on infrastructure. Uh, do you think this is a hopeful thing? Well, it is, Lester. I, I, I was, I, I wouldn't, wasn't a founder of No Labels, but I was one of the very first, helped write their mission statement and did that. Uh, no Labels got into a problem for a while because they decided they were going to uh, set their own kind of agenda, their own menu, uh, and make people sign on to it or they would oppose them. Uh, and that got a lot of pushback, including from me, and they, they dropped that. But I think the No Labels Problem Solvers Caucus has actually done very good work. Uh, I mean, they're in a tough spot because all, you know, every member in every of that group gets a committee assignment or party support based on how well they stick with their party. Uh, but uh, I think they're doing as good a job as they can within that current system. And I think they're going to help make some uh whether it's you know they may do something on the minimum wage infrastructure they may be a number of areas where they may be able to have some influence that would be helpful thank you all right um i'm going to go to manny bahar in new york who has a question about what to do in situations where you basically have one party a one party system not a two party system go ahead manny uh, thank you very much. Uh, in a state like uh, or a place like New York City, where the Democrats are essentially uh, in control, and uh, it's a closed primary, by the way, going to rank choice voting in the primary, uh, but it's a closed primary, and you can be as an independent at, at heart and vote for who you want in the general election, but the problem with that, if you don't register, and in this case, the Democratic Party, in other states, it can be the Republican, that if you don't register with the party that's dominant, uh, you're in, in effect disenfranchising yourself, that you can't vote in the primary where the real choice is made. So uh, until we achieve the things that um, we're talking about, open primaries and so on, which I'm all for, but until we're able to achieve that, would uh, people who are like me, who are independents at heart, uh, be best off to register in the dominant party in their area to be able to vote in the primary, maybe to help elect the kind of people who will get these kind of reforms that we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, you start with the system that you have, you know, the, and, and um, uh, if that's the way you are going to, so going out and, and forming some uh, little insignificant group out here just so you can feel good isn't going to do anything. So if, if you and people who think like you can get enroll in whatever is the dominant party because you still have that party system and try to influence the outcome, that's fine and that's good. Uh, but ultimately what you need to do, that would change in New York if you got rid of the party system. Uh, if you went to a California system, you wouldn't have any of that problem. People would not feel pressured you know, to go along uh, that way. So I mean, there would still be a dominant figure. I, it certainly won't be de Blasio, but uh, you know, there might be a, a dominant figure that you would rally around. But um, you know, ultimately, unless you get rid of the party ability, so this comes down to what John talks about, what I talk about, until you get away from the ability of the parties to weed out who is allowed to be on the ballot, which works against candidates and also limits the choices to the voters. Unless you get rid of that, then uh, reform is really going to be very iffy. All right, we have we have like 15 more questions, but we have to wrap it up. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it to Sean Jones in Colorado to to ask our final question, Mickey, of the day. Sean has some questions about uh, anti-corruption work that he's doing in Colorado. Go ahead, Sean. Thanks. Um, so I was just, uh, I, I've been working on an anti-corruption platform to kind of give a different level of candidates the capacity to actually have their values and ideas be recognized. Because I think in any real serious conversation about changing parties and making a better political system, we have to deal with corruption. Because as like, I, for instance, 
88% of Democrats support Medicare for all, but it's not even being a, uh, being brought up for a vote within the Democratic caucus. Joe Biden doesn't support it. And that's because of the fact that a lot of times Joe Biden takes Joe Biden's taking a lot of money from the health insurance industry. Same thing with a lot of Democrats. And what you have is this issue where a lot of times you're having these candidates like Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, who are beholden in one way to their donors because of the fact they want to get reelected and they want to give more money to the Democratic Party and the caucus and same thing the Republican Party and same thing the Republican caucus. How can you have a political system actually function when 88% of Democratic voters want something, but the Democratic Party itself won't even bring it up for a vote? Hmm. Um, I, I said that uh, years ago, uh, when Citizens United uh, came, in, came down, I said, uh, I'm not sure I know what the um, uh, what the Supreme Court justices were smoking, but uh, it wasn't legal at that time. It now is. Uh, but um, no, I, I, I agree with you. There, there have to be now, it's, it's hard to control, uh, you know, campaign spending as speech, but uh, corporations are not people. If so, I'd, you know, some should be executed probably. Uh, but um, but, but I, I think until you have some campaign finance reforms in place, that's going to be hard to do. Or until you uh, have better disclosure, you know, of uh, who gave to, to whom, uh, that's going to be a problem. So I, I don't dismiss the need for campaign finance reform, but it's something that has to go hand in hand with reforming the political system. You know, because the, the reforming the money is not not by itself going to really change things. You know, you, you need to do both simultaneously. But I, I don't dismiss what you're saying at all. I, I do think there's a problem here uh, with uh, uh, too many people. I'm certainly not going to say they all, but too many people in government uh, are in a position where they listen too much to the people who wrote the campaign checks. Thank you, thank you, Sean. That was a great question, and thank you, Mickey, for joining us. Uh, this this Zoom uh, virtual discussion will be available on our YouTube channel starting, um, I believe, on Thursday, and we'll email everybody so you can share it with friends and colleagues uh, to continue the conversation. Um, Mickey, any upcoming books or articles you want to plug? Well, I'm working on another book. Uh, so my, my last one, as you know, the article you talked about in the Atlantic became a book which, which was called The Parties Versus the People, How to Turn Republicans and Democrats into Americans. Uh, I'm working on another book now for Yale University Press uh, that goes into more detail, supposed to come out next year, uh, about that and how to make these reforms. Uh, yeah, let, let me throw in one other thing. I mean, a lot of people here may be just uh, okay, we, we covered this issue, uh, but if you want to reach out to me, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to have time to answer everybody who, who might write, but if you have a question you want to send to me, I might be able to, uh, and it's mickey.edwards at princeton.edu. So uh, I will look at it. Can't guarantee I'll, I'll have time to get back, but maybe I will. So uh, John, thank you. Thank you. This is no, John. my Jeremy, pleasure. Russell, you know, th this was... Uh, I look forward to the next 10 years. Huh? What? I look forward to the next 10 years. The last oh, yeah. 10 years have been very eventful. I think the next 10 are going to be even better. Right. Thank you, everybody. Have a okay. great day. Bye.